And now I will introduce today's speakers. George Merrick practices in the area of environmental and energy law, counseling clients in transactional due diligence and risk assessment in business and real estate transactions, as well as the assessment in assessment, cleanup, and development of brownfield sites. He represents one of the nation's largest retail and grocery store chains in the due diligence and construction of stores in Wisconsin. George's practice includes the remediation of Superfund and other contaminated properties, advising clients on wind farm projects, underground and above ground storage tank regulation, and coordinating the investigation and remediation of toxic mold. He also represents corporate, municipal, and individual clients in environmental enforcement matters. Michael Mosso concentrates his practice in the areas of environmental law and policyholder insurance. Michael represents clients in complex transactions involving environmentally affected real estate, brownfield redevelopment, negotiation of environmental insurance, environmental enforcement actions, RICRA matters, state voluntary program cleanup, CERCLA litigation, and other regulatory compliance. He has extensive experience working with federal and state agencies and with negotiating deal terms, insurance policy terms, pleadings, and settlements of lawsuits and enforcement actions. Michael has litigated CERCLA actions and served as common counsel to CERCLA common committees. Thank you for being with us today. Now I'll turn it over to our speakers. Okay, well, thank you everybody very much for being here. I know Michael and I are pleased uh, to with our in-person <coughs> attendees and for the folks on the webinar. Great to have you with us as well. Um, we've got a lot of information to cover today. We wanna to try to keep this practical. Um, there'll be time for questions at the end, but if there's anything pressing as we're speaking, you know, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll try to answer as well. Um, as I mentioned, we want to make, keep this practical. You know, the topic of environment, excuse me, evaluating and, and managing environmental risk in business transactions is pretty broad, but it, it can be broken down into some major components. First, you know, identifying environmental risks, um, evaluating what those risks are, and then finally managing them in the context of the transaction, getting to where your client wants to be. <clears throat> Here we go. I'm trying. Okay. Major goal right there. So, um, some of our goals today. Uh, we want to help you understand the major environmental liability schemes and certain defenses to them. We also want to help you understand the various levels of due diligence assessment that are out there and their legal and practical implications. Um, so that you choose the right uh, tools and the right level of due diligence, depending on what the circumstances are. And then finally, and most importantly, learn how to leverage that environmental due diligence knowledge uh, to effectively uh, manage that risk. With that in mind, and I'm going backwards again, so the, the topics um, of this presentation, very br briefly, we want to go over the basic liability concept and the key environmental statutes and defenses. There are a lot of environmental statutes and regulations out there, but some are more important than others in the context of uh, transactions. Um, we also want to um, go over um, the concept of all appropriate inquiry, which is a term of art. Uh, it's very important in the due diligence context, and it is a key component, and it's required if you want to qualify for something that's known as the bona fide prospective purchaser defense, which Michael is going to discuss in more detail. Um, we're also going to go over a number of the environmental assessment tools that are out there, um, starting with the phase one practice, other options that are out there. Um, sort of what's a hot topic nowadays is vapor intrusion. It is important both in the context of transactional due diligence, but just generally the government is focusing more and more on this pathway. So it's important for people to know about. And then finally, um, we want to help you understand and develop methodologies for addressing the risks that are found. 
So um, really in evaluating the risk, you know, you're never going to get to 100% certainty when you do due diligence. If that is the goal, it's unrealistic. However, you can winnow back a lot of uncertainty if you're doing the process appropriately and if you are doing it at the right time. So the goal is to um, reduce risks to an acceptable level, and that is going to be dependent on your organization's risk, uh, sort of their, their level of how much risk they can deal with, their comfort level, and individually as well. So um, with that, I'm now going to turn it over to Michael for a little bit. All right, so uh, let's hope this works. All right. It does. So what can affect a property from an environmental perspective? Uh, I think the most obvious are the uh, operations and activities at that property. If you're looking at a property that's been a historic dry cleaner, if they were a lead battery recycler, those kind of things raise red flags that there may be environmental conditions, maybe contamination at the property. Certainly current operations matter as well. Um, the structural conditions may be important. You know, if you are looking at acquiring buildings that were acquired in the 70s or before, they may have asbestos, they may have lead-based paint. Um, if their floors are in bad condition, if they're cracked, if the outside pavement is cracked, then any sort of pollutants that might have been released to those surfaces could have gotten down into the environment as opposed to just staying on top of the pavement. There are natural site conditions. Um, while it's not part of a phase one assessment, uh, it still may be important to developers that there may be wetlands properties which can prohibit or inhibit development, make it much more expensive. Sometimes there are background concentrations of contaminants that may be relevant, like radon, or sometimes there are arsenic in soils. Um, and then current environmental compliance, that really goes more towards if you're uh, doing a stock deal. Um, the risks are different if you're just looking to purchase real estate or look, looking to purchase the assets of a company versus looking to purchase a company's stock. When you're looking at their stock, you also need to be concerned with whether the target company has been complying with the environmental regulations. Because if they haven't, and if they have potentially incurred significant environmental liabilities, those liabilities are going to transfer with them. So under those conditions, it's important to look at their environmental compliance. The types of contaminants uh, are also going to affect potential costs of cleanup. Some contaminants, frankly, um, will attenuate naturally in the environment more quickly and therefore are cheaper to remediate. Some, like PCBs, stick around forever and can be much more expensive. Um, the media that the contamination is in is also going to be a factor for cleanup. You know, in general, soil cleanup uh, can be less expensive than groundwater cleanup. Groundwater cleanup is just typically much more complicated. Um, vapor intrusion is uh, when you have contamination of the indoor air, and George is going to talk about that a little later in. Um, and you need to kind of think then about the resulting potential impacts to the buyer. So. I think most people think about remediation obligations first. You know, am I going to buy this property and end up with some really significant cleanup costs? I think everybody knows sort of the horror stories of, oh, no, we have now millions of dollars of cleanup costs. They don't all cost millions of dollars, but some cleanup can be significant. There are other types of liabilities, um, such as the, the toxic tort. Um, so. A neighbor may find that there is contaminated groundwater beneath his property, and he may believe that the property you're thinking of buying is the source. In that case, the neighbor can bring a claim for property damage. Um, we've represented clients who have a loan property who, through their operations or prior operations, the property was contaminated, that contamination reached groundwater, that groundwater then flowed beneath a residential neighborhood where they used wells and then you find you are the target of a class action for toxic tort so that's the other kind of um, contamination expenses that are out there um, then just general suitability of the property for intended use frankly a property intended for commercial industrial use can be a little dirtier than property for residential use 
Um, on this page, I think the only uh, bullets I really want to highlight are the third and the fourth, um, because not when you're assessing um, property for purchase, you need to worry not just about the property you're looking at, but also the surrounding properties, because you may be looking at a property that makes rainbows, but if the surrounding properties are, again, are the battery crackers or the dry cleaners, that may still impact your property. Um, Non-acquired sites, that's something to think about again more in the stock transaction because if you're acquiring a company stock and that company used to operate at a location, but they don't anymore, but while they were operating at that location, they disposed of, envir of uh, hazardous substances and that results in <clears throat> cleanup uh, liability to them. You will acquire that, that liability when you acquire the stock. Same thing with landfills. If they sent waste to a landfill, that landfill then becomes the subject of, of a Superfund site, then you're going to acquire those liabilities as well. Okay, um, we're going to turn it back to me. Um, we're going to talk about environmental liability, uh, the legal framework generally. Um, this is a broad topic. We could do several hours on it alone, so this could be really condensed. Generally speaking, environmental liability is strict, meaning without regard to fault or negligence, joint and several, and it runs with the land. The upshot of that is that if you're a purchaser, a lessee, or an operator of contaminated property, you can be brought into the maelstrom of liability and uh, the costs of, of dealing with all of that. Uh, even though you're not responsible for contaminating the property at question, um, which is a very unpopular thing for people to hear. Um, one of the uh, key statutes uh, that one needs to consider is called CERCLA, Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. This is a federal statute that deals with releases of hazardous substances at a facility. Um, there are four broad categories of parties that can be deemed liable. They're all lumped together as called as potentially responsible parties or PRPs. Um, logically, the current owner or operator of the facility where the hazardous substance has been discharged. Um, a past owner or operator of that facility if the hazardous substances were discharged at the time that they owned it. Um, the person who arranged, persons I should say, who arranged for uh, hazardous substance disposal, essentially it means a generator. Um, a lot of times these sites, um, you find that it is it's either a landfill site or a recycling site. Um, many people were sending waste there for what they thought was proper treatment or disposal, um, but they arranged for disposal of it. And then finally, the fourth category would be uh, transporters, you know, haulers of the materials to that site. CERCLA, um, is by and large a government-driven statute. Um, the damages that are out there are recovery of the response costs, which means the extensive investigation and cleanup, um, typically allocated between the PRPs, which can be a long and arduous process in and of itself. Um, there is injunctive relief. It is not available to private parties. It is available to the US EPA under something that's called a Section 106 order. And generally speaking, attorney's fees are not recoverable. Um, there are a number of statutory defenses to circle of liability. The first is the innocent landowner. As you see on the screen, it says cannot have prior knowledge. Really what, what this innocent landowner category, you basically have to prove that the contamination was caused by a third party. You had no contractual relationship with them. Um, and moreover, uh, that you conducted all appropriate inquiry before you bought this property. The second category is called the bona fide prospective purchaser uh, defense, and Michael will be talking about that more. You can avoid circular liability if a number of things all fall into place. If you conducted all appropriate inquiry, the disposal occurred on the site before you purchased, and then afterwards you have to do, you have to go through all appropriate care with respect to the discovered contamination. It's not a panacea. Um, there are significant potential ongoing obligations, even if you have that defense. 
And finally, there's a contiguous property owner, which as it sounds, basically can avoid circular liability if you are the neighbor to a, uh, an offending property that is contaminated and that contamination is emanating onto the property. Um, I'm going to go through a really, really abbreviated version of the history of CERCLA. Um, 1980 is when it was first promulgated. Um, at that time, strict liability was imposed uh, based on ownership without regard to fault or negligence. Um, there was a lot of uncertainty, many uh, court decisions, a lot of litigation going on. Um, 1986, what were known as the Sarah Amendments came about. The most important takeaway from Sarah was that it added this innocent donor defense, i.e. the third party defense. And then in 2002, the Brownfield Revitalization Act added a whole host of aspects to CERCLA. Um, it, it amended the innocent landowner provision. It added the contiguous uh, property owner defense. It added the BFPP, bona fide prospective purchaser. It then officially indicated that um, the ASTM phase one standard qualified as meeting all appropriate inquiry requirements. There were other things. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go through them. Sort of one of the key issues, though, under those uh, under the 2002 Act was this differentiation between innocent purchaser and bona fide prospective purchaser. Since we're going to talk about BFPP, I'm going to turn it over to Michael now. Um, so, yeah, one distinction to highlight between the innocent landowner defense and the bona fide prospective purchaser is in the innocent landowner defense, you had to do had to inquire into the um, historic operation of the property, basically what we think of as phase one. And in order to actually um, use that defense, you'd have to have that phase one basically come back clean. Um, there had to be no basis to really uh, know of environmental contamination. And as a result, basically nobody could really uh, use the innocent landowner defense. Um, in 2002, um, Congress really sort of fixed that because there were a number of properties that were mothballed that could have been in productive use, but because, rightly so, people were afraid of becoming a current owner or operator of a contaminated property, even though they had nothing to do with the contamination, nobody was buying those properties. Um, so. The uh, 2002 amendments to CERCLA created a safe harbor for um, parties that were not responsible for the contamination and they weren't affiliated uh, in the you know, corporate structure with the parties that were responsible for the contamination to purchase the property with knowledge of contamination, but not be responsible for the cleanup costs um, under CERCLA. And one caveat to that, I would say, really not be responsible for the bulk of the cleanup costs, because there are certain costs that they may incur, and we'll talk about that. Um, that second bullet there talks about the windfall lien. This is an exception to the BFPP um, safe harbor. It only comes up if EPA has cleaned up a site and they haven't been able to recover their costs from another party. Um, and then you get that property and you get the value basically that EPA put into it. So it's a very rare circumstance. Um, it's just worth highlighting. Um, so the uh, BFPP requirements, and, and we love our acronyms in environmental law, but I gotta say I'm happy for this one because bona fide prospective purchaser is a mouthful. Um, there are both pre-acquisition and post-acquisition requirements to be a BFPP. Um, one of those I, I talked about, you have to have nothing to do with the um, disposal of the contamination in question and the contamination need to, uh, has to have occurred before you acquired the property. Um, that's, so A is disposal prior to acquisition. B, inquiries is the all appropriate inquiry that we'll talk about in a minute. C, notices, uh, that means any sort of uh, state or federal required notice with respect to contamination that uh, an owner of the property has to give, you must give. It's a fairly simple thing to comply with. Uh, 
Um, but it's important to be cognizant of it because you want to make sure you stay protected by this carve out from circle liability. And then care is the post acquisition care requirements that we'll talk about in greater depth further in. E, cooperation assistance and access. That means that if the government needs to access the property, um, you need to cooperate with them, um, provide assistance, and allow them to come onto your property. It basically just means you need to cooperate with the government post-acquisition. Institutional controls, um, some of you may be familiar with those. Um, institutional controls, really the simplest uh, example is, is a deed restriction. So if the property is deed restricted to, say, industrial or commercial uses, um, you need to comply with that. If there's a deed restriction that says you must maintain certain impervious surfaces, like parking lots or building slabs, you need to comply with that. Those are the types of institutional controls. Um, request and subpoenas, that's very similar to the cooperation. If you do receive a request or a subpoena, you need to comply with it. And then the no affiliation was the no affiliation with the party that actually uh, contaminated the property. So the, the inquiry part, the all appropriate inquiry. Um, all appropriate inquiry is a term of art uh, used in the statute. Um, the good thing is it's pretty simple to comply with because a purchaser will comply with all appropriate inquiry or AAI if they perform an ASTM standard phase one. And many of us are familiar with the phase one environmental site assessment, which is just called a phase one report. So um, any uh, quality consultant should be able to perform an ASTM compliant phase one. And if they tick all those boxes, and it is important to, to actually comply with all of it, um, then that's complying with all appropriate inquiry. Um, it is important to note, highlighted in that, last bullet that AAI must be timely. So you have to perform that within a year of acquisition and some of the aspects of that phase one assessment need to be done within 180 days from acquisition. So you can't rely on an old phase one report. I think it's also important to note that phase two work, that's what we think of when you ever have to take any kind of sample, dig a hole, test the groundwater, anything like that is not part of all appropriate inquiry. Phase one is really a visual review of the property, it's a record review, and it's interviewing people who may know something. That's it. So phase two is not part of all appropriate inquiry. So here's a summary of the BFPP. Um, so what I want to highlight here is actually that last Sub bullet comply with continuing obligations. This is really the part, frankly, that gives some purchasers heartburn. Because BFPP is a great concept. It does put valuable property back into the marketplace. But as George said, it's not a panacea. And the biggest issue with BFPP are these sort of continuing obligations that may apply. And one of the things that keeps continuing obligations in somewhat gray area is there really isn't very much case law that interprets what continuing obligations means in the context of the statute. Um, so this is this language is pretty much taken from the statute. But post acquisition, the purchaser must exercise appropriate care regarding the property's contamination by taking reasonable steps to to stop any continuing release, prevent any threatened future release, and prohibit or limit exposure to contaminants that have been released. So looking at that first sub-bullet, stopping any continuing release, we already know that you cannot be a BFPP if after you acquire the property, you have, you know, say a release from an above ground storage tank or and that becomes a contaminant of concern because that's a post-acquisition release. Um, this sub-bullet then I think refers to 
if you, you have a source of contamination on your property that's already, say, in your soil, that is then continuing to release to the environment, let's say it's hitting the groundwater and flowing off, that's something you need to address. There are different ways to address that. You could um, scoop up and dispose of the contaminated soil. You could try and remediate it a different way. You could perhaps put in wells along the border of your property and suck up any contaminated groundwater before it crosses the line. Um, you can do a combination of things, but it does require you to be active and it requires you to spend money. Um, prevent any threatened future release. So obviously anything can be a future release, but in this context, you're really talking about something you have reason to believe objectively may release imminently or in the near future. So if you acquire property that has a rusted out above ground storage tank that is, has you know, contaminants inside of it, and it has inadequate you know, safety features around it. So if there is a release to get caught, that is a threatened future release and that you would have to address. And then the third sub bullet, prevent or limit exposure. Um, that's sort of like the engineered barriers we talked about. There's um, certain levels of contamination that if let's say they're in the soil, um, they're at a great enough concentration that they pose a risk to you if you were to come into contact with it or if you were to ingest it, um, but that can be addressed by using an engineered barrier. You can pave over it, you can put in you know, feet of clean soil over it, and you can require that those barriers be maintained. And that is a way to prevent or to limit contact with existing contamination. So that's a pretty common sense, I'd say, conservative common sense approach to the continuing obligations. Um, one other thing I want to, add about the uh, BFPP before we move on, is that the BFPP protections are self-implementing, meaning if you follow these requirements, then you get the protections of CERCLA, or protections from CERCLA, as we've outlined. Um, that's good and bad. Uh, it's good because it's efficient. If you do it, then you get the protections. So you don't need the government to come in and review and say yes, you've done this correctly because government reviews can take a long period of time. The bad part is it always leaves some amount of gray um, because you're hoping that what you did is reasonable, that you've taken the reasonable steps, but without much case law, it's hard to know if you have. Um, so that's the good and bad of it being self-implementing. The federal government and certain states have programs to help people um, with the, get their arms around what reasonable steps might be through what's called their comfort letter program. And that's, as the name implies, the idea is to give the letter recipient comfort that if they take certain steps as outlined in the letter, they will be complying with the reasonable steps and therefore will be, uh, will maintain that safe harbor from CERCLA. Um, comfort letters, though, are only available in the circumstances where the government issuing the letter knows about the contamination and um, has decided upon an appropriate way to address that contamination. So comfort letters are not going to be available in every situation. Um, and the last thing to consider is, let's say you do purchase property, you've complied with the bona fide prospective purchaser requirements, so you feel confident that you're not going to be um, responsible for any sort of circular cleanup costs. Um, you still need to consider that you now own contaminated property. And the hoops that the sort of, you made the seller jump through in order to make you feel safe about it are the hoops that you're gonna to have to jump through when you wanna sell the property. So it's something to keep in mind. There's always a risk, and it's a, it's a fairly minimal risk, but it's worth mentioning that standards may change in terms of what government agencies consider safe. Um, so you may have a particular contaminant that's on your property at a concentration that everybody thinks is okay, but then 
future analysis shows, you know what, really, we should ratchet that number down, and now you are above the standard that you want to be. It's, it's possible, right? Um, other regulations may change, and George is going to talk about vapor intrusion. Vapor intrusion really wasn't something you heard about, uh, certainly not 10 years ago. Um, and there were a lot of NFR, no further remediation letters issued in various states, certainly true for Illinois, where vapor intrusion wasn't looked at. Um, no further remediation letters are often considered the gold standard. This is the government saying your property is okay. Um, but if they were issued prior to the government having vapor intrusion standards in place, you may actually have a vapor intrusion risk. Great. Um, I will now just talk very, very briefly in the interest of time. There are definitely types of environmental liability other than under CERCLA. Um, number of state environmental statutes, common law claims. The first category um, as it, is what it sounds like, the state baby Superfund laws, essentially very, very similar to the CERCLA program, but run by the state agencies instead. Um, there are other, uh, well, some of the common law actions I should talk about. Um, public private nuisance is out there, trespass, strict liability, if you're doing something that would be considered ultra-hazardous activity. Um, a lot of times, if you are facing a claim under CERCLA and RICRA, which I'll mention also, people may add these on top of it because the elements may be easier to prove, the remedies may be broader, um, so they are often added to a complaint. Um, it is true, however, that some of the common law causes of action are preempted by federal law or state law even. Um, one other thing that I, it's not on the screen, but Rick read, it's called the Resource Conservation and uh, Recovery Act. It's often called cradle to grave. It basically looks at hazardous wastes from the, or hazardous materials from the minute they are created and then when they, they become hazardous waste. Um, there are potential citizen suits under RICRA. Um, if, if that would be the case, though, there has to be a showing that there is a current an ongoing risk to the environment or human health. <clears throat> there is a potential for injunctive relief under RICRA, so I just wanted to bring that up as well. One of the other things that is up on the screen is there are other state environmental laws. Um, I do a lot of work up in Wisconsin. There is something called the Wisconsin Hazardous Substance Spill Law, um, and the reality is that most investigation and cleanup in that state does not take place under federal law, does not take place under CERCLA. It is under this statute. And the reason is, um, basically, the statute says that if you are in possession or control of a hazardous substance that has been released to the environment, you are responsible to investigate and clean it up to applicable standards. There's very little case law, but what case law there is, is definitive. If you own the property, you are in possession or control of that hazardous substance, whether you caused it or not. So if you buy a piece of property, you have nothing to do with the contamination, you're in the soup. Um, I, I don't know if there's any counterpoint, counterpoint in Illinois that's worth mentioning. Um, Illinois law is, well, I was going to say a little more lax. Maybe it's more reasonable, um, like than, reasonable. than Wisconsin. Um, the discovery of contamination generally in Illinois does not require reporting to the agency. Um, the exception for that is if you discover from a regulated underground storage tank. Um, but otherwise, you can find contamination in Illinois, but you don't have to necessarily do anything about it. And that, that is a big distinction. That's something that I didn't mention in Wisconsin. If it's above, there, there's some very limited exceptions. But if you discover it, it needs to be reported. Once it's been reported, then you go through the whole regulatory process. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about, and Michael had touched on this before, the ASTM phase one standard. Um, it is something that people know a lot about already. As he mentioned, it's a document review. It is a visual inspection. It is interview of um, available individuals. There's no physical testing, but generally speaking, what happens, you hire an environmental professional, 
they perform all the historical research. They look at the available sources, old aerial photographs, Sanborn insurance maps, if they were there for that particular location, city directories, um, fire, uh, fire insurance maps, uh, as I mentioned. There's also um, national databases. One big one is called EDR. The uh, person who's doing the report pays a fee to EDR. They tell you what the, they identify what the target property is and all of the databases that are out there on the state and national level. You look at the target property and um, sort of concentric circles for certain types of potential contaminants around that property. Uh, for example, you would be looking for leaking underground storage tanks, i.e. petroleum tanks generally. Are there national priority list sites, Superfund sites? Are there RICRA waste generators in the, in the vicinity? Et cetera, et cetera. They also do a Freedom of Information Act requests to the EPA, the, local, the state government, the local entities to find out, you know, are, is there any information? Have there been releases to the site? If there were, what happened about it? Um, the interviews of the, the site owner, neighbors, government officials, and it's very important that they do a visual site reconnaissance, which is basically a walkthrough of the property looking for evidence of potential contamination on the site. They also look at the adjacent properties, but it is not stepping onto those properties. It's literally what can you see from across the fence. And frankly, nowadays, it's also looking at Google, Google Maps. Um, you know, oh, look, there's an underground tank there, which I really couldn't see. But here's a, well, not underground, but uh, there may be some above ground storage tanks visible, et cetera. Um, phase one, there are some terms of art within the phase one rec recognized environmental conditions, and this is directly out of the standard. The definition is the presence or likely presence of any hazardous substances or petroleum products in, on, or at a property, one, due to release to the environment, two, under conditions that indicate a release to the environment, or three, under conditions that pose a material threat of a future release to the environment. Um, de minimis uh, conditions are not covered. Minimus would be, for example, parking lots. Cars drip oil all the time. Little things like that, um, or even if it's in a stock room or in a warehouse, there may be oil that is available, uh, visible on the floor, but if it's not right next to, it's, it's a small amount, it's not next to a floor drain, these things are really considered de minimis and they're, they're not going to raise to the level of uh, a wreck. There are some other definitions under the current standard, the HREC, historical rec. Uh, this is a past release that has been addressed to the satisfaction of the government agency completely, um, i.e. clean closure, as it were. Um, there's no restrictions on the property. That is, frankly, less and less common. Um, the regulations have caught up to the science, meaning that there are a lot of sites, most sites, I think, nowadays, you can leave some residual in place. So that would not be called an HREC. That would be called a controlled REC, a CREC. Um, there's a past release to the environment, but the government has been satisfied that you've done enough, um, but there, you may well be subject to the type of land use or um, activity use restrictions and limitations that Michael had mentioned before. So uh, we talked about what a phase one is. Well, what is a phase one not? Not a very good sentence, but um, clean phase one does not guarantee that the site is clean by any means. Um, it doesn't look for everything. So, and it's also a snapshot in time, frankly. Um, there could be something that you simply don't find or that occurs later on. Um, a phase one is not a compliance audit. Michael had mentioned that if you're buying an ongoing business in a stock sale, um, you're not looking just at the condition of the property. You want to know, is the business being operated correctly? Um, what do their processes look like? Do they have the right permit in place? Are they following the terms of the permit? If not, there is definitely a potential for future liability. Um, one of the things, again, it's sort of key bullet, phase one does not have eternal life, as Michael mentioned. Um, 180 days, uh, certainly a year out. Big portions of it have to be updated every 180 days. You can do an update, but really basically once. If you, if you update it once after that, if the deal has sort of stalled and you need to get a new one, you're going to need to get a new one. 
Um, and I've noted also that all phase ones are not created equal. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but yes, there are basic standards that need to be complied with. These are all humans doing this work. Um, phase ones can be done relatively quickly. They can be done by more junior environmental consultants. And it depends on what their workflow is. I mean, they may miss things. And there is a level of interpretation in a phase one as well that can impact whether something is deemed direct or not. And you'll find out later in something that I'll mention. Um, that may not be the case. And if you do a little bit more digging, you can get something removed as a wreck. So this is something that I, uh, we touched upon before, but if, if there is a no further remediation or no further action or some type of equivalent case closure letter, um, you don't assume that that means there's a clean bill of health. Um, first of all, there is residual contamination on the property. So if there's soil contamination, if you're going to want to do some future development, every no further remediation or no further action letter I've seen states, once that soil is exposed, you're going to have to handle it appropriately and safely based on whatever the environmental laws are at that time. Um, also, just because this NFR or NFA is out there, it doesn't mean that it's being complied with. Again, um, a very common thing is that you have to maintain an impervious surface, surface over some residual contamination that's in place. That may not, a phase one's not gonna tell you that necessarily. Um, and obviously you're gonna have that obligation going forward. So um, some of the other, and again, in the interest of time, I'll probably speed through a lot of this. There are many other tools in environmental assessment. Um, the first bullet that I put up here, sort of customized add-ons. Um, as we've mentioned when I was introduced, I do a lot of work for a large company that sites and builds big stores, which include retail and grocery. Over time, they have realized that there's a lot of information they need to know beforehand whether they're gonna go through the transaction. And phase one just doesn't cut it. If there's a building on site, they wanna know, is there asbestos in the building? Because there will be obviously um, disposal requirements in the future. There will be additional costs involved. They look to see whether there's radon if there are um, buildings there as well. Is there lead paint? Is there potential for lead in the water supply there? The other things that Michael had mentioned, are there wetlands on the site that could severely impact what you can do on the property, not only the timing, but the location? Um, are there ecological resources? Are there endangered species, which you'll either have to deal with as you're going through the construction period you may have to avoid certain areas. You may have to put silt fences up, et cetera. In extreme cases, there'll be portions of property you just can't do anything with because it's a breeding area for an endangered turtle or something. Um, there are other things that you'd look at, industrial hygiene, health and safety, the indoor air, uh, which we'll talk about more. Um, some of the other, I'm sorry, they're still here. Some of the other tools. An ASTM transaction screen, it's not all appropriate inquiry. A lender often uses it as a front end sort of early beginning tool. It's an easy way to get in handle if there may be risks where you'd want to do a full phase one and more. Kind of a standard questionnaire of 20 questions, um, 16 observable site observations. But again, it's just a starting point. Um, the other thing, a desktop review if you're involved in a transaction where there are multiple properties um, and if they're located in a lot of locations and some are very far away, um, it, again, this may be a starting point. You do what's called the desktop review. Again, looking at the available environmental databases that are out there gives you a sense, okay, this site looks like it might have a problem. This one looks pretty clean. You get, it's a triage essentially. You then determine which of these properties, if any, need a more full-blown uh, due diligence process. Compliance audits, Michael already talked about. Phase two, um, that means invasive testing. If there were identified RECs, meaning recognized environmental conditions, very often you will need to do invasive testing. Uh, ground, um, uh, excuse me, soil, groundwater, et cetera. Um, and the vapor intrusion assessment standard, I'll talk about that a little bit more when I talk about VI in general. So I'm going to turn it over to Michael now. Okay, so what happens after you do the phase one? 
Well, it all depends on what the phase one says. So uh, in the best of circumstances, there are no recs. And while the parties may still want to negotiate certain deal terms regarding potential environmental liabilities, you know, sort of the volume is pretty much turned down on those. It's, it's an easier uh, issue to address. If there are recs, then odds are the buyer is going to want to do phase two work. It's not always the case, um, but in most cases, the buyer is going to want to do phase two sampling. And depending on what those results are, um, that could complicate the deal because if contamination then is found, depending on the extent of it, it may result in uh, notice to a state government, uh, and then you find yourself you're in a state program requiring an active investigation and then potentially more remediation. Um, or it could just result in, okay, we found contamination. Uh, there's no immediate requirement to do anything, but you know, um, I'm not dying to buy contaminated property. So unless the contamination really is extreme and the cleanup costs look to be so large compared to the overall value of the deal, um, usually you can address the issues through the contract. Um, there's many, many ways, you know, it's, uh, whatever you can come up with is, is ways that you can address known costs or potential costs in the contract. Um, you know, there's purchase price reductions. Um, those are, I'd say, rare in that often you don't have a great handle on how much remediation is going to cost simply by finding contamination in the first instance. Therefore, you see indemnities. Um, and indemnities can be something different than just, okay, you will indemnify me for all time for all costs related to this. Um, typically, parties are gonna negotiate some kind of box around that. So there could be a floor, there could be a ceiling. Um, the parties may share in the cleanup costs. Therefore, everybody has skin in the game. I think that's particularly important where the person who has the lion's share of the obligation to pay for the cleanup isn't the person actually doing the cleanup because those things, two things don't have to go together. They often do, but they don't have to. Um, an indemnity is only as good as the financial wherewithal of the party giving the indemnity. Therefore, we often use escrows, we use holdbacks. When we're looking at um, contamination that we can tell is going to be a long track to clean it up, um, we've used trust agreements and put third party trustees in place to manage that. Um, these kinds of deal terms can be both pre and Post-closing, most of them take place post-closing because it'd be great if you could get an NFR letter really quickly and then you'd make that a condition, a pre-closing condition. But frankly, nothing with the government goes quickly and investigations take time as well. Um, so there's usually a lot of post-closing obligations in deals involving uh, environmental contamination. Um, one other bullet point that isn't on here is we've used a lot of environmental insurance that um, allows the parties to basically shift the risk to a third party insurance carrier for potential environmental liabilities. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that if we get a chance to talk about our, our case study. And the, the only thing that I would add to what Michael said is in the drafting of the contract, What's really important is that you have a well-defined endpoint. What is it that the party was responsible to do the cleanup? What is it? What's the universe of what they're responsible for? Right. And when is done? Um, it really needs to be defined very closely. Um, and there's a lot of negotiation that goes on there. Yeah, too because it's, it's all part of putting the box around it. Um, because as George said, you know, if the property is going to be used for commercial industrial purposes, you're going to want to negotiate that I need to get a commercial industrial NFR letters, for example, and that you, if I'm the seller who's required to do that, then the buyer is going to allow all the kinds of restrictions that go along with it. All that needs to be part of the document. 
Um, when you're a tenant, same due diligence applies. Um, you, because CERCLA finds um, current owners and current operators liable for remediation of the site, a tenant has to be cognizant of environmental conditions as well. Um, all appropriate inquiry uh, applies to a tenant. The brownfield protections, the BFPP, also apply to a tenant. A tenant can do it two ways. If the landlord has qualified for BFPP protections, then the tenant will just benefit from that. It derives basically protection from the landlord. But if the landlord, say, doesn't comply with continuing obligations, then the tenant, it's really up to EPA's discretion whether they want to pursue the tenant for uh, CERCLA liabilities. Pretty much uh, EPA has said in guidance that if the tenant then steps up and does those post-closing uh, requirements, the reasonable steps, they're not going to sue the tenant. Uh, a tenant can also have its own phase one done, you know, comply with all appropriate inquiry, and then its BFPP protection will not derive from or won't only derive from the owner. It'll have its own. Um, sometimes a tenant wants to do um, some environmental testing to establish a baseline. Most leases have terms that say when the tenant turns this property back over to the owner, tenant's going to return it in the condition in which they received it. They will clean up for any contaminant releases. Um, and having a baseline to establish what was actually there at the time can be very helpful in those circumstances. Um, Tenants should also be aware of, you know, development issues that may, uh, how the environment may impact, and obviously these things are then discussed in the lease negotiations. Be very fast with respect to lenders. Even before um, Congress carved out a safe harbor for uh, purchasers of property, they carved out a uh, safe harbor for lenders. So if uh, a lender won't be held liable, for uh, CERCLA costs if that lender just held, holds a security interest in the property. Um, if they actually actively got involved in management of the property prior to foreclosure, that's an exception, but that's fairly rare. Um, and frankly, since the lender liability uh, exemptions were put into place before 2000, I haven't seen a single case where a lender was held liable. Um, if a lender does foreclose, it needs to then use reasonable steps to market the property and try to sell the property. Um, those, if it, it can go ahead and even perform a cleanup, um, that will not render it responsible though for any sort of circle of liabilities. Um, it's still important from a lender to evaluate the environmental condition of the property because they wanna understand the value of their collateral. Um, and if their borrower ends up incurring unexpected cleanup costs, that could impact the ability of the borrower to pay back the loan. So lenders are fairly conservative. They frankly, usually when they're involved, um, have the same concerns as the purchaser. Um, before we go into VI, the only thing that I would mention is that there may be additional state requirements for um, lender liability exemptions. Um, Wisconsin, provide that type of protection under Wisconsin's hazardous substance spill law. Many of the aspects are the same, uh, the things that you need to do, can and cannot do um, as a lender, but there are a few little differences. Um, for example, the due diligence that you have to do is enhanced a little bit. So just keep in mind that there may be state requirements as well. Um, we have just a few minutes left. I do want to talk about vapor intrusion. Um, as Michael said, this has really become much more active and much more in the public view in the last few years. Um, it was on the radar for a number of years. I mean, all the way back in 2002, you know, EPA had this general definition, which you see up on the screen. And, you know, it, it's pretty a simple concept. I mean, there are some chemicals that could be in soil or groundwater that could volatilize and get up into buildings through a variety of manners. Um, and this diagram is very, very simplified, but um, you know there could be cracks in the, the foundation. Um, I mean, there's some buildings still around that have soil uh, basements. Um, I mean, obviously, an obvious fix would be to put some concrete down. Um, I don't run into that very often. 
um, utility lines coming in could also be another source. Um, you know, some of, I guess, where are some of the key areas where this concern comes about? Industrial properties where chlorinated solvents are used, dry cleaners, uh, their substances called TCE and PCE again, which are chlorinated solvents, which are highly carcinogenic and also uh, volatilize quite a bit. And when they get in the groundwater, unfortunately, they spread like crazy. Um, gas stations, because um, of the volatile components of petroleum, um, landfills, because of the gases that are created there. And obviously, it's not just if you buy those properties, but if you are adjacent to them. So um, I mentioned already some of the common constituents of concern. You know, there are a number of factors that impact vapor intrusion. It's, it's very site specific, um, but you, you have to understand what the source is, um, you know, what type of uh, chemicals we're talking about. Is it in the soil? Is it in the groundwater? Um, what are the characteristics of the soil? Is it a very um, sandy, sort of permeable soil where this stuff can move through very quickly? Is it a real tight clay that once contaminants are in there, it's going to be tough for it to move? Um, the building construction, uh, again, as I mentioned, sort of uh, foundation type, the basement, the slab, slab on grade, um, cracks, the HVAC system is important. Um, there's a lot of different issues that come into play. I mean, really, the moral of the story is that it's complicated. There are both state and federal requirements out there. I mean, at last count, there are 30, at least 30 states that have individual vapor intrusion rules or guidelines. Um, EPA published a guidance document in 2015. The science really is constantly evolving. Regulations haven't quite caught up. Um, but you know, why would you need to worry about this? Well, I mean, there, there really is a legitimate basis for thinking that there's a risk. I mean, you think about why you want to keep groundwater clean or drinking water clean. The average person drinks about two liters a day. Um, but the average person inhales over 20,000 liters of air a day. In today's society, most of that is inhaled indoors. So, you, you know, there's a logic to why we need to be concerned about what the indoor air conditions are. Um, why is this important? Um, you know, again, you need to uh, assess the property's suitability for use. If you are purchasing something, um, what are you going to be using it for? I mean, is it already a factory? Is that what it's going to continue to be used for? Okay, fine. Then people will have adequate health. They should have adequate health and safety uh, equipment on. If it's going to be a school, um, you need to be very concerned about what the potential risks out there. First of all, because the, um, the, the level of maturity of children's bodies makes them more susceptible to issues, and also just um, on a visual level, uh, you, you need to be very careful when children are involved. Um, abatement costs can be high. Um, obviously, the tort liability issue is out there, pop property value reductions in the case of selling it. Um, I would mention... Oh, I'm sorry, I think I went backwards. No, I guess I didn't. Um, a couple of the things, and again, we're almost out of time. Let me say that there are some big, easy fixes to try to deal with the ways of uh, soil vapor getting into a building. Seal openings around utilities, that's a logical one. If you see cracks in the floor and if it's an easy fix, do that. Um, you can also install what are called vapor barriers, which is generally a PVC or a geomembrane type of um, fabric, essentially. Um, that is an easy fix if you see this risk when you're building a property. You simply add that into the engineering. You can retrofit it, particularly if there is a crawl space. Um, passive venting is a combination of that geomembrane. And then you also put tubing underneath, sort of it's gravel, et cetera. And just generally speaking, because um, differentiations in air pressure and wind can suck air out of a building through chimneys and vents. So that passive means that as this stuff builds up in this area, there'll be vents that generally go along the side of the building and it just goes up on its own. If you have a major concern for vapor risk, you actually then add equipment. You add machinery with an active blower, you make sure that it's going, there'd be um, bells and whistles, literally alarms if it turns off so that you know to fix it. 
Um, one consideration there is obviously the ongoing operational cost. So um, I'll just leave it at that. If people have more info or need more information about vapor intrusion, I actually did an entire separate presentation on this. If you want to email me, I'd be happy to send you a copy of that PowerPoint. And I'll just highlight, so I talked about environmental insurance. I can also give a separate seminar on environmental insurance. But it's just good to know it is a um, way to smooth over some of the bumps in a deal with environmental contamination because it does provide a third party who can take on the environmental uh, risks. Um, and this was a case study I put together. This is, uh, I'll be very quick. Um, we were contacted um, by a client who had a deal fall apart about you know, 10 years prior because we were selling a stock of a company, um, they negotiated the price, and as things typically go in these deals, they then start with their due diligence. The buyer had a phase one done, and what came back was what you might think of as a buyer's phase one because there is some art to a phase one, and a buyer may often think, okay, I want this phase one to highlight the uh, potential environmental risk because then I can either uh, argue for the most expansive kind of phase two or for a bigger reduction in the purchase price. Um, so I highlighted some of these. These are actual quotes from the phase one that was done by the buyer, you know, 10 years prior. Um, and it made the place look like a toxic hellhole. So um, it was so effective that the deal cratered. Um, client still wants to sell the stock of the company, so give me a call, said, what should I do? Um, because the um, it was a going concern that they were selling. They were selling the business, it was a profitable business, it was not a sale for redevelopment. Um, I said, look, let's see if we can get environmental insurance. Um, this, These were to the stock of companies that had operated two facilities since the 1900s, doing every kind of metal bending, stamping, painting, using all the kinds of industrial solvents that were very common in the 1900s up to 2015 when the deal closed. Um, we were able to, we did an, a new phase one that was a much more measured phase one. Um, we were able to get an environmental insurance policy that protected the buyer and the seller from claims from any third party. Um, we, uh, we basically packed that together when they then went to market and said, this is what you're getting and you're not allowed buyer to do any phase two testing. So here were these heavy industrial use sites um, that we sold without allowing the buyer to do any phase two testing. They did have to get comfortable with the environmental insurance and environmental insurance is a very negotiable product. So we negotiated the hell out of this policy to make it as protective as possible. Um, and as a result, the deal closed for the purchase price and everybody was happy. So on that note, are there any questions? Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, okay. So David asked um, if there are discharges from, say, a Fluid discharge, you've got processed wastewater discharges or stormwater discharges, and those result in contamination is, you know, what we've talked about here still applicable. Um, the answer to that is yes, if those discharges have resulted in contamination. Because everything we talk about is certainly applicable both to soil, to groundwater, to surface water contamination. Um, Discharges under like the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, which is the national system or any of the state equivalents, those are basically like exempt from CERCLA. But if you have 
if those discharges are through a conduit that has cracks in it and that goes into the soil and then you've got a contamination problem, that is not exempt. So um, yes, it does apply. And there, there was one question from a webinar listener and it basically said, uh, with the new administration in Washington, D.C., and recent changes in the leadership at U.S. EPA, which some might call business friendly and others might call anti-environment, uh, do you think there will be significant impact in how one needs to conduct environmental due diligence? No. No. Um, short answer. Short answer. I mean, the, the changes that are out there are different programs. Um, due diligence, you're going to need to continue to do it this way it was. And even if there would be some thought about changing it, it's way too big of a shift to turn around that quickly. All right. Well, With that, thank you, everybody. We thank apologize you. for going a little late. And please come to the next month's business law training session.